The world is full of fantastic ancient archaeological discoveries, but some are more famous than others. You've all heard of the Pyramids of Egypt and the Colosseum of Rome, for example, but there are other discoveries that are just as worthy of your attention, yet barely receive any. We're going to try to do something about it with this video of stunning, but mostly unknown, fantastic archaeological finds. You'd expect to find a place with a name like the Cave of Hercules in Greece or Italy, but it's actually in Tangier, Morocco. The cave, or to be more accurate, caves, are set into one of the most northwestern points on the African continent and are steeped in so much myth and legend that it's hard to tell what's real about their history and what isn't. One of these myths says that the caves were visited by Hercules himself, hence the name. He slept in the caves before stealing three apples from the Garden of the Hesperides as one of his twelve labors. A different legend says the cave network is so long that it runs for 15 miles reaching Spain, while a third claims that Gibraltar's macaque monkeys only made it to Gibraltar because they left Africa via the caves. None of these stories are true, but the truth is even more amazing. The caves aren't natural. They take advantage of natural features, but the first opening to them was carved by the Phoenicians more than 2,000 years ago. A second opening was added centuries later by the local Berbers. Pompeii is one of the most famous archaeological sites in the world, but people tend to think of Pompeii as one cohesive site rather than considering all the smaller discoveries that have been made there. One of those discoveries is a domus known as the House of the Veti. Like everything else in Pompeii, it was frozen in time when the volcano struck in the year 79. The Domus is so named because of the men who live in it, Aulus Vettius Conviva, who became a priest after being freed from slavery, and Aulus Vettius Restitutus, who was also a freed man. Almost all of the beautiful frescoes in the house of the Veti are fully preserved and are considered the best surviving examples of what historians call the Pompeian Fourth Style. Twelve different mythological scenes are painted across its walls, including the punishment of Ixion and Dionysus discovering Ariadne. We know the names of the owners of the House of Veti because they were found on a pair of bronze seals inside the front hall of the Damas. The relationship between the two men, save for their shared experience of slavery, is unknown. Since we're talking about Roman discoveries, let's talk about the magnificent statue known as the Dying Gaul, which also sometimes goes by the names of the Dying Gladiator and the Dying Galatian. Mystery surrounds the origins of this work of art, but it's commonly believed that it was commissioned around 2250 years ago by Attalus I of Pergamon to celebrate an important victory over the Galatians, who once lived in Anatolia. Similarly, it's thought that the sculptor was Epogonus, the court sculptor of the Attalid dynasty, but that can't be proven either. Whether it was sculpted by Epogonus or someone else, it's a replicate of a Greek bronze that was created around a century earlier but was lost long ago. The statue was incorrectly known as the Dying Gladiator until the 19th century because when it was rediscovered in the 17th century, the historians of the time believed a gladiator was what the sculpture represented. It was only after a re-examination that experts determined the torque, thick hair, mustache, and weapons of the figure in the sculpture are more likely to be Celtic than Roman that the piece was given a new and more accurate title. We mentioned the Celts a moment ago, so let's talk about something that was made by a Celt. Or at least we think it was. It's the Braganza brooch, and it's a gold ornamental fibula. The artifact is around 2300 years old, and if it wasn't made by a Celt, it was likely made by a Greek craftsperson for a Celtic Iberian customer. The history of the object is a little murky as the circumstances of its supposed rediscovery during the 19th century are unknown and it changed hands between several private owners in Portugal before it was bought by the British Museum in 2001. Several of its previous owners were members of the House of Braganza, including Fernando II, who was the consort of Queen Maria of Portugal, hence the artifact's name. The fibula is notable not just for being made of gold, but also because of the figure attached to it. 
an otherwise naked warrior wearing a traditional Celtic helmet, protecting himself against a hunting dog with an equally traditional Celtic sword and shield. The piece is in pristine condition, save for a missing pen. Our next artifact is a truly strange thing to look at. Perhaps you might think it's an early prototype for an automobile or a four-wheeled variation of a bicycle. Actually, it's neither. It's the Colt Wagon of Stretweg, and it's 2,600 years old. The unique vehicle was found in an ancient Hallstatt culture grave close to Judenberg, Austria in 1851, surrounded by bronze amphorae, jewelry, weapons made from iron, and tack and harness gear. Historians have difficulty interpreting the object. At its center is a 12-inch tall figurine of a woman standing upright, holding a bowl above her head. She's surrounded by other humanoid figures in both sitting and standing positions, and deer-like animals and horses. Experts have suggested that the scene might be intended to depict sacrificial activity, but that's far from certain. It's possible that the bowl might have held sacrificial blood or might have been used to hold libations. It's a one-of-a-kind artifact and is currently on display at the Archaeology Museum of Schloss Eggenberg in the Austrian city of Graz. The occupant of the grave it was found inside has never been identified. The Dibjerg Wagon is a logical place to go after looking at the Stretweg Colt Wagon, but its name is inaccurate. It's not one wagon, but two discovered as a composite in a peat bog in Dyberg, Denmark in the 19th century. Archaeologists have identified it as a votive offering and say it was ritually dismantled before being placed in the bog on purpose around 2100 years ago. Back when the wagon was discovered, it was seen by the people of Dyberg as confirmation of ancient folk legends about wagons full of gold that were allegedly hidden in the bogs hundreds of years earlier. Modern historians aren't so sure, though, as they say that there are similar legends about wagons laden with gold hidden in bogs in the south of Sweden, and none have ever been found there. More to the point, the Dybjerg wagons, or wagons, weren't full of gold when they were found, although they're of excellent quality and would likely have been used for ceremonial purposes before they were placed into the bog. The wagons are now on display in the National Museum of Denmark. We're staying in Denmark a moment longer to look at the Golden Horns of Gallius. These stunning artifacts made of sheet gold are so named because they were found in the town of Gallius in southern Jutland. The first horn of the pair was found in 1639, but the second wasn't discovered until 1734. Experts say that both horns date to the beginning of the 5th century, which would be the start of the Germanic Ice Age. Historians still aren't 100% sure what the horns were used for. They might have been blowing horns, but it's equally possible that they could have been drinking horns. A drinking horn made of precious metal is more likely than a blowing horn, but we can't rule either possibility out. Tragically, the original horns were stolen in 1802, then melted down and sold. Cash taken of the originals taken in the 18th century have also been lost, so the copies of the horns that still exist today are based on casts of replicas. Even these copies have a history of being stolen, with the most recent such event happening in 2007. The Betolina map is one of the oldest topographic maps in the world. This precious piece of history can't be found in a museum. If you want to see it, you have to travel to Camonica Valley on the Italian side of the Alps where it's one of many ancient petroglyphs. While it's obvious that the prehistoric engravings on the rock are a map, opinions differ about what it might be a map of. It's possible to interpret some of the features on the map as plots, paths through the mountains, or perhaps even entire villages, but every interpretation requires a little creative thinking. There are 109 separate figures on the rock, but not all of them were carved at the same time. Some of them may have been added as long ago as the Bronze Age, 3,000 years ago, but the more recent markings are 800 years younger. Because of the additions, it might be more accurate to say Betolina maps rather than Betolina map. It's likely that this was the work of people recording their territory, 
but we don't know which people or what territory. We've already looked at the golden horns of Galahus, and we said that it was impossible to know whether they were blowing horns or drinking horns. It's far easier to be certain about the purpose of the Oldenburg horn. It's definitely a drinking horn, and it was made during the 15th century. The horn is made of gilded silver at its base, but it's elaborately decorated with enamel and attracts many admiring looks from visitors to Rosenberg Castle in Copenhagen, Denmark. The elite members of Danish societies treated drinking horns as prized possessions during the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, often passing from one generation to the next as heirlooms. The Oldenburg horn might have been the first such horn not to be bovine in origin. It was made specifically for King Christian I in 1465, but history doesn't tell us who made it. Apparently, he intended to gift it to the three kings in Cologne Cathedral, but changed his mind and brought it back home with him. It's been in Rosenberg Castle since it was sent there by King Christian V in 1690. There was a big win for the British Museum in 2008 when the institution received £350,000 of funding, allowing it to keep hold of a rare and unique astrolab that was discovered during building work in Kent three years earlier. The artifact, which was made in the 14th century, is the ancient equivalent of a pocket calculator. It's one of only eight of its kind that are known to exist anywhere in the world. Aside from being able to tell the time, the Astrolab can measure height and depth and can even be used to map the stars. It's now known as the Canterbury Astrolab Quadrant and is on display within the museum. While it's referred to as a quadrant, the piece is actually complete. Geoffrey Chaucer, author of Canterbury Tales, was known to be an expert on Astrolabs, so considering this one was found in Canterbury, and was almost certainly made during the author's lifetime, who's to say it didn't once belong to him? It might look primitive, but this was among the most sophisticated calculation tools available to the human race prior to the invention of the computer. Archaeologists have discovered hundreds of old baptismal fonts in Europe, but none quite like the baptismal font of Hildesheim in Hildesheim Cathedral, Germany. Most artifacts inside the cathedral are well documented, but this one isn't. It was probably made during the first third of the 13th century, but there's no way of knowing for certain. The fact that it's so mysterious only adds to the interest, but even if we knew who made it and when, it'd still be considered one of the most outstanding objects of its type in the world. The font once stood in the western reaches of the cathedral's nave, but was moved to George's Chapel in 1653. After being removed and placed in a museum while the cathedral was being renovated between 2010 and 2014, it was returned to the nave. The decorative style of the pot has been identified as Gothic art, but its architectural elements show a clear Byzantine influence. To make it even stranger, the faces of the figures etched into its surface are unusually expressive for the era. The entire font is one big enigma. You'll find plenty of ancient standing stones in England, but because Stonehenge hogs so much of the limelight, many of the others are ignored. One of the best examples of that is Andlestone on Stanton Moor in Derbyshire. It's also sometimes known as the Anvil Stone and the Undlestone, although locals call it Two Penny Loaf for reasons that have been lost to the fog of time. We're not sure why it's called the Anvil Stone either, as there's no evidence the stone has ever been used as an anvil. The stone stands alone in the middle of a field with a dry stone wall around it. The wall is a relatively recent addition. The stone itself is thought to have been standing for well over 3,000 years. In fact, it's possible that it's always been in this location, but about 3,000 years ago, people started decorating it with cup and ring marks. We have no idea why they did that, and unfortunately, it's impossible to gather any reliable archaeological evidence from the site because so many generations of local children have used it as a climbing wall. We can't even say when people first started calling it the Andalstone. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.
and see you in the next video.